Hello? 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 What was that? Okay, today we're going to talk about uh, pen testing, uh, moving from art to science. Of the people in here, how many people have an interest in pen testing or do pen testing? So, wow, a lot of people, a lot of people. Um, well, the thing is, uh, pen testers, frankly, we have a lot of problems. Uh, there's no real repeatability between tests. You have one tester do a test, you have another tester do a test, even the same test, or if I do the same test twice, you know, the fact I'm going to get the same results, I mean, that's not even guaranteed. That's a big problem in terms of, you know, providing useful results to our clients. Uh, it also then produces inconsistent results. You know, again, the results that we're producing, you have the same person or multiple people run the same test, you still get different results each time. And that just, you know, leads up to the third one of, you know, it provides really limited value to our clients uh, and, and really, you know, degrades the whole testing process. So the key thing here is we really need measurable and consistent and repeatable results. In order to have the results be useful, they really have to be measurable, consistent, and repeatable. And this brings us to goal-based pen testing. And uh, really, the big thing with goal-based pen testing is knowing your client. Because each person is going to have a different need based off of, uh, you know, the type of person they are. So look at the business person. You know, what are some of the business person's requirements, you know, for a pen test when it comes down to it? You know, the first big one, price. You know, price is a big thing that, uh, you know, is uh, one of the big drivers of business. Um, other would be, uh, you know, compliance requirements. Are there requirements around the, uh, you know, compliance requirements around the use and uh, test results to, to make sure that those fit their needs? You know, so you get into this and you get into stuff like, you know, are they archive quality results? You know, are they producing, uh, you know, products that are archive quality? You know, do they have anti-check washing features? That could be something that could be of interest to uh, a business person. And then, you know, finally, I want to make sure, you know, leak resistance is very important. Uh, you know, business people very concerned about appearance. You need to make sure products that, you know, are, are leak resistant. And then ease of use. You have a large business environment where um, you're going to have a, a wide range of people. So you really need ease of use so that the whole population can use it. So what are some other requirements? Let's look at another large group, drafters and designers. And for them, you know, they're also going to have requirements of, you know, things like ease of use. Again, it needs to be something, this is a tool they're using every day. It needs to be something that is easy to use and uh, also has a good feel. Like if you're, you know, spending eight hours a day using something, it needs to fit very well, work very well, you know, consistent line quality, consistent line uh, width, line consistency, again, very important. Uh, smudge resistance to make sure that, um, you know, patterns aren't smudged, lines aren't smudged is just critical. And then also the ability to do fine detail is also just of the utmost importance uh, for drafters and designers. Third group we'll look at are artists. For artists, you know, consistent results, again, critical. This is their lifeblood that they're working on here. It needs to make sure they're consistent results. Smooth operation, if you're using it on a daily basis, has to operate smoothly. The feel is just critical. Ease of control. Being able to easily control, um, you know, the, the flow, the design is just critical. Uh, solid colors, and then finally fade resistance. You know, if you're working on a piece for hours on end and then five years later the, uh, the pattern fades, you know, you're going to have a really pissed off customer spend a lot of money on a piece of artwork that's then starting to fade. So now that we talk about kind of some of the goals there, the next big thing is let's figure out how we got here. So with that, we're going to go through a history of pens, kind of talk about how it is we got here, and um, what the problem is. 3000 BC, first evidence of reed-based pens being used. Uh, this was in the first dynasty in China. Uh, and on the picture there is an example of how a reed-based pen is used. They basically take a, a reed, which is a 
hollow plant, carve out the tip, carve it down to make a proper size. They dip it into ink, the ink actually gets sucked up into the pen and then they write and you need to keep on dipping. Uh, that was the first recorded use of pens. Then uh, 500 BC was the first actually um, written reference to pens inside literature and that came out of India. Uh, and it's interesting to see how you know, some of the technology has spread throughout the world. And then um, 100 BC, uh, the quill-based pen became popular in Europe. And the quill-based pen, I want to take a chance to just focus on for a minute here, because this really became the pen standard for um, you know, pretty much most of uh, you know, the pen's life has been the quill-based pen. Really, even up into um, you know, the, the 18th and 19th century, the quill-based pen or similarities of it were basically the, uh, you know, very popularly used. So to make this, you start out with a tail feather from a goose or another large bird. We'd again trim it down similar to a reed feather, a uh, reed pen. And uh, again, ink was stored inside the pen. You'd dip it in, also called dipping pens. And then write, dip, write, dip. 79 AD, big invention came through. We started to see evidence of uh, copper metal nibs being used in Rome. Actually, in the ruins of Pompeii, they found copper metal nibs, uh, which is the first case we've seen of uh, moving away from uh, quill-based pens or uh, bamboo or reed-based over to uh, using metal. So in this case, uh, you actually used copper to form the nib of the pen, which is the part that writes. Um, another key item is uh, 105 AD, the modern paper uh, process was invented in China where you used uh, rags or plant fibers uh, to uh, make paper. Before then, People wrote on things like uh, uh, just straight wood, rocks, um, pounded down plant particles, but they didn't actually follow the normal paper process that we see today. And this process uh, actually started to migrate over to uh, Europe. Uh, first, during the uh, battle of, uh, there was a battle between the Chinese Empire and the Islamic Empire at the time at uh, Talis. And basically, when uh, the uh, Arabs defeated the uh, Chinese, one of the things that had occurred is as they moved into that area, they got access to paper making technology, which was very restricted up until then, and that then allowed it to flow into the Middle East and eventually up into uh, Europe. So then the uh, 1953, first recorded record of a pen which held ink inside uh, occurred, and this is actually where ink was stored inside. It's still not a perfected design. So we move on, uh, we actually get the first paper plant in Spain, which came in again through the um, Muslim influence into the Muslim parts of Spain, where uh, paper started to uh, come into existence. And then uh, 1702, the first real known fountain pen was invented, but there were a number of problems with this design. 1803, metal pens became patented in terms of uh, uh, pen points. And uh, we started to get patents that started to appear in the pen market as uh, people started to lock down this critical technology. Now, pen points are basically uh, pieces of metal that have been formed into different shapes. And uh, the plus is they are very uh, durable, reliable, unlike a quill. They, um, you know, last a little bit longer. And uh, basically, you would fit them into a handle of some sort, again, dip into the ink, dip and write, dip and write. And this was actually the main type of pen used well up until the ballpoint pen became popular because fountain pens were used in a lot of cases, but fountain pens have always been fairly expensive devices. So when you go into a bank, even into the 1940s and 50s, there would actually be dip uh, nib pens out because the fountain pen was too expensive to leave out. So this was really one of the mainstays uh, up and also is the first time we started to see pens being produced in a uh, industrialized fashion. So we'll move on, we had, uh, you know, fountain pens continue to grow. 1884, L.E. Waterman uh, designed the first really working fountain pen. He used a famous three feeder model and spoon feeders, which allowed ink to consistently flow down to the paper and uh, provided very consistent results. Uh, and actually, in 1888, the first patent was issued for a ballpoint pen, uh, but it was actually designed to write on leather opposed to on paper and never really became commercially viable. 1890, one of the first big improvements came with fountain pens with safety pens, and this gets back to the goal-based issue of uh, these pens actually had features in them to prevent leaking because it was very, um, you know, difficult to have a fountain pen in terms of it would leak on stuff, you know, that could obviously harm the end user's uh, use of the technology. So this is the first invention of, uh, of safety pens. 
Now with fountain pens, there are a variety of ways that they can actually be filled up, and there are four major systems. This whole thing, I could probably spend just a whole hour talking about different filler systems that are present, but be known that there are different types of filler systems that are out there that have evolved over the years. Uh, the ones that remain to today are pretty much the two bottom ones, uh, the piston pneumatic system for, uh, for filling up fountain pens. And yeah, a key thing, I mean, for people in here that are not as into pens uh, culture as I am, you know, may not realize that, you know, when you get into the finer pens, the pen and the ink are actually separate items. And this will become critical later on when we talk about testing processes, of needing to have testing processes that can test both the ink and the pen qualities and how they interact. Big improvement occurred in the 1920s. This is really when uh, reliable, portable, and self-contained fountain pens uh, emerged onto the market. And fountain pens really became a reliable uh, writing implement. 1930s, the first cartridge-filled pens came out. Uh, pens before with fountain pens, you had to actually put them into the ink well, do some sort of filling mechanism to fill them up with ink. The cartridge pens, they had separate cartridges. You just basically pop in this cartridge, and that's where you get the ink from. The first ones were um, actually glass, designed to be disposable. And they were made by the uh, JAF Waterman Company. And that's actually the French uh, division of the world famous uh, Waterman Company in the US, uh, which is really instrumental in early pen design. During 1939, the uh, first working ballpoint pen was, uh, for paper use was invented by the uh, Bureau brothers. And uh, in 1940, the uh, Bureau fountain pen was patented. Uh, shortly after that, actually, it was purchased by the UK government for the war effort, because uh, one thing that fountain pens provided and really gave the allies an edge in the war is uh, old fountain pens would not work in unpressurized aircraft, especially at high altitudes. Yes? I do not, but I could, uh, I'd be happy to help try to look that up. And um, basically, during you know older times, the uh, in unpressurized aircraft, a fountain pen would not work well, or during pressure changes, the ink may not flow well, may blot, but the Allies had a huge advantage using these fountain pens that were usable at all altitudes and inside pressurized cabins. So that gave the Allies a huge advantage over the Axis powers by being able to reliably write and record information while in flight. 1943, the first commercially available fountain pens were available. Uh, during the late 1940s, the price dropped down to uh, 50 cents per pen, uh, which at the time was still expensive, but not as much as uh, you know $100 or so. Yes. Uh, before then, it was around the 125 mark, which was still pretty reasonable, but when you got down to 50 cents, it became uh, much more cheaper. <laughs> Basic math. Uh, that That is actually um, not an adjusted dollar, so it's still a fairly expensive item, but not compared to uh, fountain pens or other things that were much more expensive. Yeah. Yeah, come on. More expensive, -er, yes. Uh, and then uh, 1950s, actually, a French baron uh, dropped the H from his name to form the Bic Pen Company, which was a, a huge invention, a huge uh, development, uh, basically. Uh, but at the end of the 1950s, the ballpoint phase, I'll actually ask to have questions held to the end just to, to make sure we cover everything. And I'll be up in the breakout session <laughs> to, uh, to review things. Um, you know, maybe we can get out some demos and uh, try some stuff out hands-on. Statements, let's pop a pen. Yeah. See enough of your stickers around already. So the, the 1951, the fountain pen really actually temporarily died because of real quality issues. 1954, ballpoint pen came out in uh, big force with the Parker Jotter. Uh, in this case, uh, prices again dropped uh, in terms of these are relativistic dollars, or no, these are actual dollars at the time, but still uh, cheaper than digital ones. Move forward, at this point, we start to see the big pen company actually start to overtake pen manufacturers, and this shows the rise of the fountain pen over, or rise of the ballpoint pen over the fountain pen. Uh, we had things such as the modern felt tip pen was introduced, uh, Fisher release or space, spe, uh, pressurized space pen, 1967, pens made it into space. It's part of the NASA project. Before then, it was grease pencils or pencils. 
We then had the early introduction of porous point pens, which most people refer to as uh, drafting pens, so things like microns and uh, those type of pens. 1979, big development in the ink area, erasable pens came out. Move on, we have developments such as the uh, jelly pens, the uh, Uniball 207, which is the first uh, pen that prevent check washing. So as you can see in this fragmented pen market today, uh, repeatable and measurable pen testing standards are even more important as things have just diverged so much. So with that, I'll take a step back and we'll talk about what are some of the existing pen standards. There are ISO standards that presently exist <laughs> for pens. Um, before I did this research, I did not actually know there are actually ISO standards for uh, pens and testing pens. Uh, we have ones for tubular tip pens, such as uh, drafting pens, and they actually have procedures for uh, testing these pens. Uh, there's also standardized vocabulary. There are additional ISO standards that get into things like ballpoint pens, gel pens, and um, rollerball pens. But it, again, the issue here is we have these different standards for different technologies. So it's really difficult using the ISO standards to compare a ballpoint pen to a rollerball pen. So our goal here is to help bridge that gap. I'm still actually digging into those, and yes, I'll say, We'll hold the questions. <laughs> so we'll now move into pen rating systems, uh, systems you can use to rate pens um, as, you, uh, you know, as you work on them. The first one is Optave, and this is the operational pen <laughs> testing. <laughs> pen testing and value equation. It was developed by PERT. <laughs> the pen evaluation and rating team uh, out of Pittsburgh. Um, this uh, system, you develop scenarios and then evaluate the pens against them. It is a qualitative approach to pen testing and really focuses on the operational values of pens, such as the reliability and total cost of ownership. Of course, there's the pair model, which focuses on <laughs> which is the pen and ink rating system. And the big thing that PAIR introduces is the ability to actually uh, rate the pen and ink together, since those are critical items. And this takes more of a qualitative approach. As you can see, we have a nice little uh, flow chart here where you can flow down through the different characteristics and uh, qualitatively measure the results. Those are kind of two competing standards. But really, all pen rating systems have one problem. The tester cannot provide reliable and repeatable results. So because of this, uh, you still, you know, garbage in, garbage out. We can't really get to the point where we're debating uh, pen rating systems if we can't provide reliable data into those systems. So it's key that, again, we come up with a standard system here. So with this, I propose a line we can draw. <laughs> the starting of a pen testing standard. First, the test process. Uh, first is paper selection. Uh, and with this, we want to standardize on paper types or different weights of paper. Uh, we decided to go with 20-pound uh, uh, online white paper. And we wanted to go with 20-pound because that way you can uh, do the test, flip it over, see what sort of leakage occurs onto the other side. And since 20-pound is the most common type of paper used uh, in an office environment, it allowed to, t to detect if uh, leakage was occurring through the paper. You also want a medium tooth which is the actual roughness of the paper. And uh, medium tooth, again, is a good standard in terms of uh, being able to test a variety of different pens. A, uh, and actually, higher tooth paper uh, can cause some problems with fountain pens, and then a lower tooth paper can cause problems with things like, um, excuse me, ballpoint pens, uh, which can actually get proper rolling friction. Uh, so we went with medium tooth there to standardize that. And the other key is to have even weight distribution. Uh, when you get into cheaper paper, this is something where you look at stuff like moleskin books that have come into popularity in the US. Uh, the weight distribution on them is actually uneven. So if you start writing with a fountain pen at the top of the page, it'll look wonderful. When you get down to the bottom of the page, uh, the weight has actually dropped a little bit, and you'll start to get splattering and splotching as it spreads out. Um, so it's really key to make sure you have consistent weight across the paper. So a test at the top has the same results at the bottom. Because again, if uh, the medium is changing, that could provide uh, difficulties for the tester in making sure you're producing consistent results. So the general pen testing process, uh, uncap the pen, draw five parallel lines four inches long in rapid succession, recap the pen, and analyze the results. 
So let's look at some of the analysis that occurs. You want to rate each of these four areas on a scale from 1 to 10. And uh, we are actually developing rating guides. They'll provide uh, very uh, consistent results on what a 1 is, 2, 3, 4, 5, and all the way up through 10. Again, to make sure that one tester, uh, two testers looking at the same test results or testing the same pen will get the same results. So you look at things like continuity. Is the line a, a solid line? Are there any breaks? Is it a smooth line? Is there any initial blot? On some pens, when you first put down the pen, you get a heavier ink, and then it moves into a line. Are there any end blots where at the end you pull it up, and is there you know, heavy blotting at the end? Uh, end blots are something you'll notice with things like uh, microns, other uh, disposable drafting pens. And then there's also width consistency. Is the width of the pen line consistent across the board? So any discussion of pen testing would not be complete without talking about automated pen testing systems. Of course, there's the famous one for its price and first on the market, Pure Impact. <laughs> there's the MetaWrite project, open source tool set with its awesome image. <laughs> and then, of course, they've started to commercialize it with the MetaWrite Express and MetaWrite Pro, as they offer more uh, GUI-based, uh, hands-on capabilities to the pen testing framework. <laughs> now, my wife and I have been working on something, and we have invented uh, our own automated pen testing system here. And this is uh, the first prototype of it. Uh, actually, uh, later on, uh, we'll be selling uh, t-shirts online with this design if anybody wants to get an automated pen tester um, you know, to wear around with pride. So with that, we'll now go into some, some case studies. With this, we look at the Aurora fountain pen. It's a lower end fountain pen, has uh, a steel nib, so it uh, provides uh, inexpensive pen production. Most of the nicer pens have a uh, gold plate nib on them or a solid gold nib or a platinum nib. Uh, so this is a cheaper pen. And uh, we'll go and look at the test results. So as you can see, uh, color consistency is weak across the board. We do see heavier blotting at the end uh, as you pick up the pen, and some bleeding that occurs even on a medium tooth paper, uh, which could imply that the uh, ink is uh, not being applied properly. Sure. How does tester error? User error, yeah, and that's something that we're still working on, but um, as we start to do this, we have a large testing community we're starting to fan out the results to then compare uh, what the results are to then figure out ways to improve upon that, because that is a huge concern. If you have a skilled pen tester versus a, uh, an unskilled pen tester, you can often get you know, very different results that can come out of it, uh, especially a concern as we start to move some of the pen testing process over to uh, you know, outsourcing them to uh, third world countries and other places, where you get into, um, you know, different standards there. So that, that is something that we are definitely really looking at. Uh, that, that is possible. Uh, that is possible. I mean, you, you can get into problems with some of the more expensive fountain pens get rather big, and the kids really can't properly hold them. Um, so that, that, that can be an issue there. But that, that is something that needs to be taken into account from a comfort point of view, because, you know, some of that has big beefy paws, or a dainty person may, you know, find a pen uh, different. And that's where we're really needing, uh, one area we haven't addressed is comfort. Yeah, I mean, how, how they met, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, it usually does not, but again, this is stuff we're looking at. Um, I mean, the key here is this is a, a first step down a very long road, and uh, 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 any long journey starts with one step. So next up, we have the Bic Rollerball, uh, Bic Grip Roller. This is a rollerball type pen. This was a uh, fine tip pen, 0.7 millimeter ball. And uh, according to Bix website, it's appropriate for home, office, and school use. Could be. So here we have the different results. Again, uh, over here we have a break in the line, um, some blotting that's occurring at the end, but fairly consistent, uh, you know, line composure in terms of uh, color and other items, um, you know, with the uh, the pen usage itself. I believe this is our final example, the Lamy Safari. 
fountain pen, which is again a steel tip pen, uh, medium nib. And uh, in this case, we are using Aurora 5 ink inside of it. Uh, this pen, the ink is, ink is separate. So uh, depending on the ink you use, it can also impact the performance of the pen. So here we have this, and I mean, the results here are, are pretty telling. <laughs> very, very weak line drawing, um, lots of bleed over. Uh, you know, some of the stuff at the end, you're starting to get some color consistency, but it's also starting to blot up. Uh, so, you know, really, um, you know, pretty, pretty telling, pretty much says it all. So with that, conclude with, uh, as I mentioned before, any journey starts with a single step. This is the first step down a long road to generating uh, consistent and measurable pen testing results. And I, I am touched that as many people came out um, to see this. I, I, I've been uplifted by how big the pen testing community is in terms of people that uh, do it and are looking to get into it. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to see, especially the younger generation getting involved, to make sure that this art is not lost. And as we take this art and move it into a science, we can then provide produce, reproducible results that can be of value to our customers. Yes. have inferior pens and they are hiding the end blot failures in the serifs. Well, that would be a mitigation technique um, <laughs> to be able to mitigate the risk of a, um, of a poorly produced pen. So I mean, that, that can be if, uh, if the business is accepting that risk of using that uh, type of font style and is willing to provide training to their staff. Because the key thing there that also gets into the ease of use is if you need to then provide additional training to the staff, if you know you have a pen that costs a dollar and then a pen that costs 50 cents, but you need to train your staff how to do serif fonts, um, then you're going to be getting into, you know, potentially the total cost of ownership would be less just to go to higher quality pen. So Mick and I are wondering, with all this pen testing, are there black cap pen testers? Mm. <laughs> that is a, an interesting idea. Now, when, when you get into, um, I, I don't really want to get into the whole white ink, black ink, red ink, purple ink, you know, gel with the glittery ink discussions. I prefer not to judge a pen tester by the color of the ink they use. I prefer to judge them by the, by the results of their testing and if they can produce consistent and reliable results. So Matt, how have you had to adjust your pen test methodology for the private sector versus government clients? Mm. Yeah, it was actually interesting. A lot of the early tests I was looking at with government sector, um, like most things, I mean, there's the uh, NIST uh, 63.12 standard that uh, outlined pen testing requirements for government organizations, but they were uh, focused on steel nib pens, which, you know, haven't really been in existence since the, you know, 1950s. Uh, so in typical government standards, the, the standards they're using to test their pens are really not appropriate to the modern day uh, modern day pen. So there, there had to have been some, some adjustments made there. And I'm hoping some of these methodologies can flow back into the government sector to provide value there to, uh, to make sure that, you know, we are, uh, uh, you know, producing uh, results that are also useful in the government sector. So one thing that's a little concerning is that the, uh, in the your pen testing framework that you're proposing, I don't see altitude playing a large role. That, that's actually a, a very good point. That, that is something that, you know, one of the reasons I want to bring this up to this community is uh, we, are a, uh, we are a community of, uh, you know, smart individuals that, that have a passion for pens. So, you know, there are going to be things that have been missing initial standards, and, and altitude is definitely a very good one. As I was discussing before with the uh, problems with fountain pens uh, in unpressurized cabins and other areas, uh, altitude can definitely impact the performance of the pen. So we'll need to... Uh, and in some requirements around uh, relative barometric pressure in the room, and uh, you know to make sure that uh, the you know the pens are being tested consistently, and potentially generate standards for uh, high altitude testing, unpressurized cabin testing, and other types of areas. Uh, I do have some uh, freedom of information requests out to NASA to see if they have any specific pen testing requirements around pens in space. Uh, they do have a nice page up about the history of the Fisher space pen, but they don't really get into the testing uh, methodology they used to select that pen for their use in the space program. Yes? I have the microphone. Um, okay, so I'm, Good. I'm, I'm genuinely concerned, actually. You're leading this pen testing effort, correct? I, I'm one of the folks involved. I would say I'm, a, I'm one of the, you know, we're, we're a community effort. You're, you're a figurehead. You're, you're there in front. 
Uh, two notes. One is I don't think people in this room are taking it seriously enough. Um, <laughs> and and I'm, 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 I am pox on you all. Um, a serious question, as one of the members of the community involved in pen testing, are you concerned or even evaluating the weaponizing of these systems? And mm. I speak specifically about the Shiv and Zip Gun contingent. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, anytime, when you have a technology you love and you see it used to harm or hurt other people, it, uh, you know, it, it definitely, de definitely strikes at, at your heart. And, um, you know, that, that is one thing where, you know, I like to provide uh, these results as information. I, I, I hold many workshops on teaching people how to use pens, proper use of pens, and I just hope they'll take that knowledge and use it in an appropriate manner, you know, not to harm other people. But, you know, there are going to be people out there that, that may take that approach, and, uh, you know, it, it saddens me when it occurs, but I, I try not to let that discourage me from spreading the wonderful information there is about pens. Thank you. Wait, uh, Oh yeah, we got a half an hour left. <laughs> We're good. So, uh, Matt, you know, I'm glad that you're bringing light to this important subject, and I was wondering if you could speak about some of the um, uh, integrity checking that happens in the ISO process to make sure that the assessment is even from test to test to, you know, say, avoid an instance where an assessor does uh, a checklist very quickly. Um, pencil whips the audit, if you will. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't like to use the P word, but um, <laughs> that, that does occur. That does occur. And um, it's interesting. It's really the, the testing when they talk about integrity in the ISO standards, they're not as much looking at integrity of the test itself, which is one of the issues I'm trying to resolve. They're mainly looking at the um, archivability and the security of the uh, ink itself in terms of, will the ink, you know, that's used on a government document uh, still be legible and readable 50, 100 years down the road? So when you talk about integrity, it's important to define those terms because in the government sector and with the ISO standards, they're talking about the, um, the archive quality of the ink, not the integrity of the test. And that, that, again, is just one of the problems there of you can have somebody which, uh, you know, does not do the test properly. And in that case, I mean, you could have you know, government organization that purchases pens that don't have proper archive capabilities, and uh, you know, 50 years from now, we go look at their documents and they're faded. I mean, that's that's history that's lost. Hey, Matt, do you have any uh, interesting or inspiring words of wisdom to new and upcoming pen testers? I do, I do. There's, um, it's a broad world out there, and uh, community is very important. Glad to see we have a community here, not a compromised place for people that can combine the art and technology of pens together into one area. Uh, for folks that are interested in this, I recommend to get more involved in the community. There's the Central Ohio Pen Show that takes place uh, in the second weekend in October, uh, which is one of the larger pen shows in the country, right down in Columbus. If you go down there, you can uh, see lectures devoted to pens, pen culture, and really get involved. You'll find it's a very caring, giving community, and uh, when you do get involved, uh, you know, when you give, uh, give a little, a lot will be given back to you. Hey, Matt, I have a question. Yes, so Dave. what do you want from us as a community? How can we help you improve this standard and help you? Because obviously it sounds like the, as, as the start of um, this project, there would be a follow-up to this. So what could we do to help you with that follow-up? Excellent question. And you know, as I mentioned, uh, any journey starts with a single step. Uh, multiple hands makes a heavy load lighter. So you know, the more we can uh, pull in people to do testing, review these standards, uh, the better it is. So once we come up with solid standards, we'll then need to have people to go out and uh, spread the word and uh, properly train people on, on how to do this test to make sure that uh, all corners of the world know how to properly test pens and we can provide those consistent and measurable results uh, across the board. Matt, I know there's, there's a lot of controversy, controversy among the community. I want to know, where do you draw the line between a pen test and a pencil assessment? Mm -hmm. I, I've pretty much stayed out of the uh, pencil and uh, marker. Um, marker testing, and actually the, the marker testing, a, a, a huge debate on our mailing list is right now uh, where to draw the line between a marker and a felt tip pen, because uh, they, they definitely have similarities. Uh, and, and we're still actually fighting out, you know, where, where, where does a marker start and where does a felt tip temp pen begin? 
Luckily, pencils are, are a fairly easy area uh, to, to draw that line, and we basically have left the pencil testing problem um, to, to another community to, uh, to take up. Yes. Um, when you're talking about testing pens and uh, how that works out, there has to be some kind of adjustments. How do you guarantee things like the viscosity of the ink? Yeah, and that's where you get into, um, there'll probably be separate standards that come out for looking at the ink as well. Uh, if we go back, uh, let's see, to the, uh, to the pair equation, uh, I mean, one key thing, of, oh, go on, there we go. One key thing about the pair equation is that uh, it is pen and ink rating, and they actually uh, break down the line into two separate testing areas, one side for the pen, one side for the ink, because uh, definitely you get into things like, um, especially pens that are refillable, the, um, you know, that adds a huge, whole other variable in terms of the viscosity of the ink, the archive quality ink, the smoothness of the ink, and then how that ink interacts with that pen as well. Because depending on the feeder system that the pen has, which is a system that carries the ink from the reservoir down to the tip, uh, different types of uh, ink may work better or worse with that particular pen. So that really brings into play a lot of uh, the concerns there. And, and Pear is working on this, uh, but, but it's still being used. And uh, Jim Jones, who invented Pear, uh, actually up in town at uh, Progressive Insurance uh, to try to provide reproducible results there, um, you know, has been really been fighting this battle. And it's definitely something where I don't have a solid answer, but it's something we're, we're committed to finding a, an answer to. Uh, this project is a great uh, step forward, but have you already started looking into outreach for pen development firms, maybe the open source pen projects? Well, I've reached out to the uh, American Pen Makers uh, Association, which is an industry trade group that exists and uh, has been heavily involved in making the ISO standards. Uh, sadly, um, because they've been involved in the ISO standards, uh, they kind of are fully invested in those standards and uh, have been a little resistant um, to that. So we're hoping to, to build up some mass. But uh, as you're talking about outreach programs, we have had a very good um, inner city outreach program uh, in terms of pen education and pen testing standards uh, to be able to train up the future generation again to, uh, to provide uh, pen testing results. So with this, I think we'll have a couple more questions and we'll break, but uh, three. okay, three more questions. Three. Perfect. Go for it. I'm number one. Um, oh, I got the mic. I, I do want to volunteer. I, I don't have much in the way of technical ability. Oh, but your, your comments have just been amazing throughout the talk. It's, it's been great to see your support. I, I agree. Um, <laughs> but I, I would like to say as a web developer, Mike, Mike and I, we both work for FARC, we'd like to open up server space and we think that we can help you with like an ICANN or DCMA for pen is mightier. We can get you that. Oh, that would be, that would be awesome. If you do that, we can find content to fill up that site and, <laughs> and, um, make it a, uh, a central point of travel on the internet. So that would be, that would be wonderful. We'd love to talk to you more about that. Penn Island, that's good as well. Or, uh, yeah, you're doing it right, pen testing. That's probably taken. But anyways, yes. Uh, well, I, I don't want to say anything bad about pens. I really like the work you're doing, but uh, I did notice in your talk you failed to address the whiteout exploit. <laughs> <sighs> Anytime you start talking about pens or pen testing and you get into zero-day research or other disruptive technologies, um, you know, that, that, can, that can open a, a whole other, other can of worms. Um, you know, as, as far as, uh, you know, the, the whiteout testing goes, uh, you know, that can affect some of the ISO standards in terms of archivability of the pen, but doesn't really impact the use of the pens, although an interesting area uh, with rollerball specifically, uh, you actually need to be very careful when writing over whiteout uh, because uh, rollerballs have a uh, much thinner ink and a ball that's easier moving and it's uh, very easy when writing over whiteout to actually have that clogged the pen. Uh, so there could be some further testing there in terms of anti-pen clogging abilities um, that can be caused by whiteout, uh, but as far as the ability to, you know, uh, Ultra documents and stuff that really falls into to other other key areas there. Um, but you know, as I brought up, you know, any sort of uh, you know exploit or zero day attack against pens is, is of concern. But that's kind of further down the road to make sure they're uh, they want to be taken care of in the standard. But for today, 
we're really focused on just getting repeatable consistent results. Then we'll look at the unknown that's on the horizon. Matt, as a college student, um, I'm learning I, I'm learning a lot about pens and actually your your talk has really opened my eyes. Excellent. Um, it's where do where do I start? Where do I continue from from here? Well, we uh, have a mailing list. It looks like the nice gentlemen back are going to offer to help us set up a website. Um, we do offer internship programs uh, to uh, help gain those those valuable skills uh, for um, you know for for being able to uh, do the testing and get hands-on experience in the field. Because as anybody knows, you know the the college education is, is wonderful. It's definitely great to have, but having that hands-on knowledge can really be the edge up to get uh, the job in the competitive pen testing industry. With that, we have one more question. And then uh, we'll wrap it up. So, Matt, I might be, uh, you know, kind of the outlier here, but where do you see digital signatures going with this? <laughs> <laughs> well, we embrace changes in technology. As we went through the history of the uh, the pen, it is one that's really focused on um, technology and technological advancements. From the advent of the early reed pens up through, you know, pressurized space pens that can work in a zero atmosphere, uh, we have embraced the use of technology in pens. Uh, presently, some amazing pen research is going, excuse me, going on in Japan, where they, that's really become the forefront of pen technology. That's where the jelly pens were, were originally introduced uh, just uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, digital signatures, we feel, you know, there's definitely a place for them. We think that people that are going to uh, like the use of pens, um, you know, people uh, people seem to like the use of uh, of uh, you know paper of, of paper books, which are I mean they're kind of like uh, they're kind of like e-readers, but they have these pages, and um, you know they seem to be pretty popular among people that like the hands-on tactile feel. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming out. I really appreciate your time. Mr. Neely will be available.